officially get started now. And again, thank you all for joining us for our webinar. All of your lines should be muted. Um, we are now starting the presentation, so please don't unmute your lines. If you have a concern or a question, please put it in the chat box. Um, there will be a chance at the end of the program to ask additional questions, um, or throughout the program you can put them in the chat box. And you will be receiving the recording of the webinar as well as the slides in about a week or so. And we encourage you to fill out the feedback form. It's very brief, which at the end of the program, but it helps us um, as we move forward with additional webinars and, and different topics that we may have. It is my pleasure today to introduce you to our speaker, Harvey Michel. Um, Harvey and I go back a long way, um, and I remember being very impressed by his knowledge as well as um, his passion back then, and I have to say it has not wavered at all, and he just has more information that he can, he can now share. He's a two-time kidney transplant recipient. He founded the Living Kidney Donors Network after he realized that those in need of a kidney transplant weren't getting the information that they needed to become successful at finding a living donor. Through his work with numerous organizations, his workshops, his webcasts, and personal consultation with those in need, Harvey has helped hundreds through the transplant process. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Harvey myself. Harvey? Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it has been a long time since we've known each other, and it's been a, a pleasure to continue the relationship. Uh, I've been looking forward to making this presentation uh, to your group. To provide everyone with a little more background, I started, uh, as Kathy said, uh, Living Kidney Donors Network after my first kidney transplant, uh, which I required as a result of a genetic condition, uh, PKD, polycystic kidney disease. Uh, I'm sure many on the call are PKD patients, about 7% of uh, those waiting for a kidney transplant are PKD patients. Uh, I was fortunate that my wife was able to, to be my donor. We both recovered very quickly, and I realized that from what I learned, I could help others by educating them on how to have a successful uh, living kidney transplant experience. About a year and a half after my transplant, I developed a virus. Uh, it attached the kidney. It's called the BK virus. And as is the case with most viruses, uh, just like the common cold, there isn't a treatment for the BK virus. Uh, my fit, uh, kidney function uh, declined, and five years after my first transplant, I was told I'll need another. Uh, so after years of helping other people develop their kidney campaign, it seemed a bit ironic uh, that now I had to take my own advice, which, as it is for most, uh, was difficult to do. Uh, I'll provide you with a little more information about my journey to my second transplant a bit later. Uh, the title of this program, Having Your Donor Find You, may seem a bit strange. Uh, most people think you need to ask someone to donate. And I've spoken to hundreds of donors, and I've inquired to them, how did your recipient ask you to donate? It was very common for me to hear, no one asked me to donate. I heard about their situation, and I wanted to learn more. The important takeaway from this is that you don't need to ask anyone to donate. It's all about your story. That's your number one task. A successful kidney campaign happens when others hear your story and when family members and friends, I call them advocates, share your story. I will talk more about advocates a little later, but they're really important to the process. I believe a large percentage of kidney donors heard about their recipient's need from an advocate. The more people who hear about your situation, the more likely it is that your donor will find you. There are good people in the world, and I believe that your donor is out there. They just don't know about your situation, or they're not educated enough about living kidney donation. So that's your goal. For the social workers and other professionals that are on the call, I'd welcome exploring how we can offer this material or a program like this to their patients or a workshop that I offer. So let's get started. And as Kathy said, you can put in some uh, chat notes uh, or questions that you have, uh, and I might be alerted to, to one or more during the presentation, or we'll have more after 
or a more Q&A after uh, the program. So in the business world, they say uh, knowledge is power. I think knowledge is confidence. And it gives you the confidence to talk about the subject. So I'm going to urge you to learn as much as you can about living kidney donation and kidney transplants, about your condition, because it'll be much easier to talk to people. And the more they know about the whole process, the, the more likely it's going to be that they'll help you uh, in your campaign, passing the information along, or hopefully finding that, uh, that eventual donor. Uh, the information I provide is not medical, although you might ask a medical question, uh, I might give you some general ideas or some ways to explore it, but I'm certainly not going to provide you with any medical information. Uh, here are some what I call myths or misconceptions, and, and maybe you have uh, uh, some misconceptions about the whole process. Um, and we'll refer back to these uh, and more because this is information that you may use to help educate the people that, you're, uh, that you want to uh, talk to about your situation. So many people think you have a spare, uh, but it's uh, most conditions, my condition, polycystic kidney disease, it affects both kidneys, so you really don't have a, a, a spare. The two leading causes of kidney failure uh, are diabetes and hypertension, high blood pressure, and they affect both kidneys. So uh, uh, you really don't have a spare. No one really knows why we have two kidneys. Uh, you don't really need two kidneys. Um, you know, most people think you need two to have a normal life, and you don't. About 750 people are, uh, one in 750 people are born with one kidney, and their life expectancy is the same as someone born with two. So, uh, like I said, we don't really know why we have two kidneys. Um, uh, if you ask a donor, they know why, uh, and that is to donate one. Um, people over 65 can donate. Many hospitals will say if you're over 65, uh, uh, don't even consider being a donor, but uh, that typically is no longer the case. But if you hear it, it's not someone's age. Uh, it's, it's their health. Many 23-year-olds aren't healthy enough to donate a kidney. And people think the matching is one in a million. Uh, my wife uh, often hears, gee, what a, what a miracle that you were a match. And the matching is very different these days. Uh, there are many reasons for that. We'll get into some of them. But the primary reason is the drugs that I take no longer require uh, that quote unquote perfect match. So many people can donate an organ. Um, and it doesn't need to be that perfect match or a blood relative anymore. Uh, the waiting list is about 115,000 people. That's for all organs. Most people are waiting for kidneys, about 95,000. But that really pales in comparison to what the need is, because we have over a half a million people uh, on kidney dialysis, and all of them need a kidney transplant. Uh, there are many challenges as to why uh, they're not pursuing a transplant. Uh, maybe they're not educated about it. Maybe they're no longer healthy enough. Uh, to get a transplant. Many of them might have been healthy enough when they started dialysis. So the, the challenges uh, of education is not only to educate people about living donation, but also about transplants too. Uh, and that's a challenge. Uh, also, all waiting lists are not the same. And to give you an idea of how that works, um, there are uh, different wait times. For example, California, New York probably have uh, two of the longest wait times because of the population in, in the area. And to give you an idea of states that uh, have shorter wait times, um, uh, I give out some in Florida, uh, I should say some centers in Florida, um, and then you can look at Wisconsin, Iowa, uh, Minnesota. And the reason for that uh, is because uh, organs are distributed first locally. So there are 58 organizations that are called OPOs, organ procurement organizations, and they facilitate organ donation. So uh, there are these 58 different areas, and some of them have a shorter wait, wait time for a deceased donor organ. So if a deceased donor organ is a good option for you, I would encourage you to get listed in an area uh, and I can provide you with a list of these if you email me. You'll have my contact info at the end uh, as to which areas uh, have a shorter wait time. And the reason that uh, uh, it's only one national list but shorter wait times is that organs are first uh, distributed locally, so within those local 58 areas. If there isn't a match, then they'll move out. 
and they'll look for someone to match that deceased owner organ within the region. There are 11 of them. And if there's no match, they'll look nationally. Very few kidneys are uh, leave a local OPO because of the, uh, the tremendous need that's out there. So like I said, a, a deceased owner organ, if that's a good option, you should consider getting uh, transplanted uh, or getting listed, I'm sorry, in another area. So last year, there were uh, uh, 23,000 kidney transplants. Uh, most people think that there are more living donor transplants, but there aren't. There are significantly more, almost a uh, little more than twice as many uh, uh, deceased donor transplants as there are living donor transplants. So those, those are the numbers. Um, and again, it's helpful for you to let people know about that because they may not be aware. Uh, of the scarcity that is out there. Um, it, recently, there have been more deceased donor transplants, um, and that's certainly a positive. Um, one of the things that they're not going over is the reason for that. Um, and the primary reason for the last few years is because the number of drug overdoses that have occurred. These are good organs. Uh, they're good kidneys for people. So it's certainly a positive that there are more available it's certainly sad for the reason for that. And also, uh, hepatitis C infected organs are currently uh, being used. And those numbers have gone up. The reason why hep C organs are used is because they're able to cure hep C now. So uh, a hep C organ, uh, if it uh, is transplanted into someone and they develop hep C, they can cure it now where years ago they weren't able to and didn't use those organs. So that's uh, two of the reasons why the number of uh, deceased donor transplants have increased over uh, recent years. And there have also been more living donor transplants in, in recent years. Um, and that is mostly from paired exchanges. I'm not going to get into the numbers uh, for that, but last year there were over 1,000 uh, paired exchanges. I recently, just in the, in the last week, uh, wrote my February newsletter, and I wrote about that in there. Uh, you'll get a link to that at the end also. So paired exchanges uh, have become a significant uh, number of paired exchanges, and uh, we'll talk about paired exchanges uh, uh, a little more. I briefly talked about uh, you know matching, and, and people think it's difficult to find a match. Uh, the term match is kind of overused a little bit. I would prefer to use the terms suitable and compatible. A suitable donor is someone who's healthy enough to donate, okay? And a compatible donor is someone who's able to donate to their intended recipient. So the matching uh, term that's used is a, a, little, uh, a little misleading. I want to talk about two very important blood tests for you to be aware of. One is called a PRA. It's a blood test done on, on uh, a recipient. Um, and the important uh, word here is these antibodies. So PRAs are measured zero to 100. You prefer zero. Zero is, you know, preferable. Uh, the higher the number, the more difficult it is to find a compatible donor. So let's just pick a number and say your PRA is 20. What that would mean is that 20% of the population wouldn't be able to donate to you that you have these antibodies that you would reject their organ. And you wouldn't, you know, that, that's the primary reason you're not compatible with someone. So those are the antibodies in the recipient's blood. How do these antibodies develop is one of three ways, either from a previous transplant, a blood transfusion, or for some women, not all, giving birth will raise these antibodies. So if you are currently registered at a transplant center, uh, they, they already know your PRA. So if you don't know your PRA, all you need to do is ask your coordinator. Uh, it's a blood test. They do it early on. So uh, a center will know what that is. It's also re referred to as being sensitized or highly sensitized if you have a high level of these antibodies that are there. So uh, if you don't know what it is, uh, what your PRA is, just ask your uh, coordinator. Um, and I'll, again, I can have other articles uh, that'll explain uh, PRAs a little more. A cross match is literally when they take the blood of the recipient and the blood of the donor and mix them together. 
you're looking for a negative cross match. If it's positive, that means that your donor is not compatible with you. Um, early on in the, uh, when you have a, a, a living donor, they might do a cross match, especially if you're highly sensitized. They want to see if someone is compatible with you. But they'll always do a second cross match, uh, either a few days or a week before the transplant, just to make sure that you're still compatible uh, with, the, with your donor. So those two blood tests are really important uh, to know about. And the word matching comes from these uh, six antigens that are on a, in our blood. And uh, before our immunosuppressant drugs uh, became as good as they are now, you needed to be that perfect quote unquote match. Uh, so you hear the term matching used a lot. Uh, you might read it in articles uh, a lot. I do all the time. Typically, uh, when a journalist or someone is talking about, gee, we were a perfect match, I think they mean they were compatible because perfect matches just don't happen that much. Uh, and this gives you an idea of this whole matching uh, process. This is broken out. Um, the green shows deceased donor transplants and the blue shows living donor transplants. And this is the uh, longevity of the organ. Uh, they call it the, uh, it's a, they call it the half-life. It's when 50% of the organs uh, are, are no longer functioning, but 50% are. And if you look at the first bar, you'll see that they include all of the matches from one anti or zero antigen to a five antigen. And they group them all together because what they found is there isn't a significant longevity difference when there's a zero match or a one out of uh, six or a two out of six or a five out of six. Uh, but there is a significant difference when there is that perfect match. So in a deceased donor, uh, the difference is between 10 and a half years and 14 years uh, between a perfect match and one of the others. And you can see the significant difference in living donation. A perfect match is 28 years. Uh, one of the other is 17 years. So just to compare uh, the two, a living donor, uh, you can compare that the um, uh, 10 and a half years to the 17.8 years. And generally speaking, what, the, uh, what they say is a kidney from a living donor lasts, on average, twice as long as one from a deceased donor. So let's go over some of the types of living kidney transplants. Uh, one is the related, you know, uh, uh, sister, brother, mother, uh, father, uh, cousin, et cetera, non-related, spouse, friend, um, someone you didn't know before. And there's something called a non-directed donor. Some people refer to them as altruistic. A non-directed donor is someone who says, I want to donate, but I don't know anyone in need, and I'd like to be a donor. Uh, there aren't many of them, or only about 300 of them every year. But as you'll see, they uh, can really save many lives and have a significant impact. So when you don't have a compatible uh, uh, donor, you get involved in a paired exchange. They also call them swaps uh, or chains. So here's a simple paired exchange. You have donor one, not compatible with recipient one, donor two, recipient two. So they do a swap, okay? Donor one donates to recipient two. I'm giving the example of two pair here. It could be three pair, four pair, five pair. Uh, they've done 20 pair, 30 pairs uh, of, of uh, paired exchanges. They, begin, they get very complicated, uh, certainly, when you have large numbers like that. There's another type of paired exchange. It's called the domino paired exchange or a closed paired exchange. It starts out the same way as the, uh, uh, the donor, uh, the two pair that I mentioned. But here's this non-directed donor, okay? If someone says, I don't know anyone in need but I want to donate. If you have another donor, you need another recipient, and they do the, the paired exchange. They call it a domino because the non-directed donor makes all of the others fall into place. It's kind of a cute little, little uh, description uh, or label for it. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, the, the domino paired exchange or the closed is the recipient three is from the waiting list. So someone has been waiting for who knows how long, and they get a call and they say, your transplant is, you know, in two weeks or, or so, and, they, and they're really shocked by it. 
uh, but it is like winning the lottery uh, uh, to be able to be involved in a domino paired exchange uh, that's there. So those those are uh, uh, they did a 50 pair domino exchange where one person started a whole chain where 50 people got transplanted. Uh, they really are very very powerful. So there's uh, another one called an ongoing paired exchange, and th this is the one that really has the chains. And what happens there is they don't bring in a third recipient. So there's an extra donor here that didn't donate right here. And so this person donates next week, next month. Uh, in one case, they, they donated a whole year later uh, and started another chain. And so that chain will have an extra donor also. And I know of one, they have 13 iterations uh, that have gone through. One non-directed donor saves on average six lives. So it really is quite powerful uh, how many lives this one non-directed donor uh, can save. So um, I've talked a little bit about paired exchanges. There is something that I call the conundrum with paired exchanges. And I've written about it. You have a link here. And there's also a link on to it on uh, the uh, homepage of uh, the Living Kidney Donors Network website. The conundrum is that uh, paired exchanges uh, uh, work differently uh, at different transplant centers. And I'll give you just a general idea of, of what I mean by the conundrum. You could be at a transplant center that doesn't do paired exchanges, okay? Most do now. But let's say you're at a transplant center uh, that does paired exchanges, and they'll say they'll put you in their paired exchange program, and that's great, okay? Uh, however, uh, they, let's say they're in a big city. I'm in Chicago, and so I'll use Chicago as a, a good example of this. Uh, there are quite a few transplant centers. And let's say you're registered at Transplant Center A, as an example, um, uh, and, and you have an incompatible donor. Uh, Transplant Center B, which you know is in the same city, they may have another incompatible pair that is a perfect match for you, that you can do a paired exchange with this other uh, uh, incompatible donor. These centers don't talk to each other. So there's no way of them knowing that, uh, that you will match with somebody else at another center. So that's one of the challenges with, the, with, with paired exchanges. Now, there are three paired exchange programs that are out uh, doing these paired exchanges. They're national programs. They don't do transplants. I call them co-ops, or technically they're not, but they work like a co-op. So each of these organizations uh, goes to transplant centers and they say, give us your incompatible pairs. We have a computer. We'll put them in there and we'll have a larger pool of incompatible pairs. One of the ways of getting matched up with another incompatible pair is to be in a larger pool. So there's a benefit to being in uh, one of these co-ops. And the, the challenge is one of these co-ops called the National Kidney Registry, another is called the Alliance, and UNOS, who does uh, the disease donations, they also have a paired exchange program. But the National Kidney Registry is doing more of these paired exchanges than the other two. So what I tell people is I encourage them to look at the information and try to get listed if you have an incompatible donor at one of the National Kidney Registry's affiliate, affiliated transplant centers, and then you can look at some of the others. Um, so here is uh, some information about the National Kidney Registry, and on my website you'll see more information about the other programs. And just to uh, let you know, I have no affiliation with the National Kidney Registry. They don't support my organization financially or in any way. But I'm trying to give you the best outlet uh, if you have an incompatible donor uh, in getting transplanted. And they are doing about 70% of all of the paired exchanges nationally. So if you have some questions about that, um, you can ask them now. I know it could be a, a little confusing about how these paired exchanges work. Um, and I'll take a look at some of the uh, 
the information that, that you're providing. So um, there are challenges, some challenges for donors to donate in that it's expensive to donate. Uh, the biz biggest expense that donors have is taking time off from work. They could have travel expenses or other kinds of expenses. It is perfectly legal for you, uh, someone in need, to reimburse a donor for any expenses they have, lost wages, travel expenses uh, that they may incur, uh, even an expense, uh, uh, there are donors that uh, live alone um, and they need a health care provider to come in for a few days or a week after to help them recover. You could even pay for those expenses. So if you have the financial wherewithal, you can reimburse them or you can fundraise. There are many organizations uh, that you can go to to fundraise. One is popular one is GoFundMe. Uh, another source of getting financial support is uh, the National Living Donor Assistance Center. Uh, they are funded by the federal government. There's a, that's another way to provide financial support. I have a whole list of other ways or other uh, outlets uh, for financial support on, on our website. So we've talked a little bit about educating you about living donation. Let's talk about uh, communicating that need, okay? How do you get the word out there? Uh, it's all about storytelling. As I said earlier, uh, the most important thing for you to do is to tell your story. And, and that's what our lives are about, is telling stories, okay? Where you ate dinner, a good meal, a bad meal, a good movie, a bad movie. So you need to start to get comfortable in telling your story. And don't think of it um, uh, of needing to ask someone. Remember, it's all about telling your story. If you're good about telling your story and providing the important information, um, it'll be obvious what your need is. Uh, and people ask me, how often should I you know, tell my story? And you should tell your story to everyone. Uh, uh, coffee shop baristas donate kidneys. Cab drivers, uh, cashiers at grocery stores donate kidneys. They don't have much time uh, with their customer or the person that, uh, that told them about their story. So you don't need much time, okay, to tell your story. You need to be comfortable in telling your story, and you need to keep it short. Um, we have a, a, a Facebook page, and I'll off, this is my story, and I'll often see a posting like this uh, that someone put there. I contact the person, I tell them, I'm going to delete the posting because no one's going to read it. I didn't read it. We have a short uh, uh, kind of patience. Uh, so keep your, st your story short, both when you write it out and when you're telling your story. Keep it concise. And here are some ideas as to what you could put in your story and also a technique in uh, writing out your story. Uh, use bullets because it gets things out there very, very quickly, um, and you don't need to, to, to have a long paragraph about it. Uh, so here are some ideas as to uh, what you can put in your story. And the, and the last one, I want to, things you want to do, see your grandchildren, travel the world, uh, uh, start to uh, take hikes more often, where, whatever it might be uh, to tell your story. Uh, because what, what stories need to do to impact someone is you need to connect with your story. There's some connection that needs to be made uh, to the person that's out there. Uh, so as I said earlier, advocates often uh, make that donor-recipient connection, and that's exactly what happened with my transplant, my second transplant. Um, I was uh, on Facebook one day just uh, uh, looking at stories, and I saw a posting by someone who I didn't know uh, as I said, I'm in Chicago. This woman happened to live in Seattle. She posted a story about organ donation. I contacted her and I asked her, you know, why she did that. You know, she connected in some way. Uh, and she said, no, she, she just thought it was an interesting story. Uh, so I told her my story, okay? Um, and uh, kind of left it at that. I thought that was, you know, the last time I'd be in contact with that woman. But Stephen, who ended up being my donor, Stephen lives outside of Detroit, um, he saw her story and he contacted her because he'd been thinking about being a donor for, for a long time and he wanted some more information from her. And she said, gee, I can't help you. However, why don't you contact Harvey? He has a nonprofit organization and by the way, he needs another kidney transplant. 
Stephen and I were involved in a three-way paired exchange. Uh, a very long story, uh, but uh, it just shows you uh, that the advocate doesn't need to be a close friend or family member. It could be anyone. And these stories are happening because of social media. Would I have met Stephen 20 years ago? Not likely. Okay, but social media has really changed the whole opportunity uh, to meet people. Uh, they see opportunities that others don't see. Um, and uh, the best advocate is someone who tried to donate and found out that they had a medical condition, that they're not able to be a donor. So they can advocate on your behalf and say, I wanted to donate to Joe, but I'm un unable to do so because I have this medical condition. So it's very powerful for them to, to, to help someone in that way. So here are four different groups of people or groups that you can reach out to. I'll go over each one individually um, in terms of how you can get your story out there. So with family members and friends, I'm going to encourage you to write out your story. And I mean write. I don't mean type it out. You will write things that come more from the heart than you will typing because those thoughts will come more from the head. So when you write out the story that you want to tell people, write it out, hand, hand write it out, and then you can type it because you will say different things when you write it out. That's not something that, that I'm, uh, a thought that I have. This is something that's been, a lot of research has been done on that. I, uh, I suggest you include the contact information uh, for the donor advocate. And the reason for that is some people might not want to contact you at first. They might want to learn a little bit more about it. Maybe they're not sure they want to be a donor. Maybe they want, don't want to disappoint you uh, should they find out that they have a medical condition uh, where they're not able to donate. So I think it's important to include the name of the hospital and the, get the name of the donor advocate uh, at the hospital that they can contact. Uh, and, and when you write out your story or post something uh, anywhere, I would include a photo of yourself, of you, your spouse, uh, a child, a grandchild, e even a pet, okay? When you have a photo of you and someone else, it seems to connect more with people, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, same thing in a video, if you do a short video. Uh, years ago, I told people uh, the video needs to be five minutes or shorter. Then I went to three minutes or shorter. Now I say one minute that's going to be the length of your video because people don't have the patience to look at it. And if you email me, uh, I'll email you links to a couple of very short videos that are, that are effective. And locally, you can get your story out. A local uh, newspaper, magazine, schools have newsletters, religious groups, reunions. Uh, there are all kinds of outlets out there. Uh, where you can share your story locally to get to, uh, to get some uh, additional exposure as to your situation. And if you want to read stories about people who have gotten a transplant or who need a transplant, uh, stories that are written every day, uh, Google has a, a service, it's called Alerts. And you'll go in there and you'll put in keywords, kidney transplant, living donation, um, I, I put PKD in. Uh, I get a dozen of these stories every day. So if you want to reach or get ideas as to how to get the word out, sign up for alerts, and you'll get many stories a day. I promise you, many stories a day. So using email and social media um, is, is, uh, is very common these days. Um, you know, using Facebook, Twitter, really any social media uh, site. Uh, and when I speak to people, they say, gee, I emailed my uh, uh, people uh, or I post it on social media. You have to continue to email people and continue to post on Facebook, Twitter, and other areas. My analogy to that is McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Do we really need to see another ad? And the answer is yes. They say yes because they want it top of mind. And I say the same thing. You want to remind people that you're still looking for a transplant. Use email to educate them. Use Facebook to say something new or different. And I'll give you many ways to do that or ideas, okay, to post often or to send out an email. I have something on my uh, website called Tuesdays with uh, uh, updates. So for me, uh, it would be Tuesdays with Harvey. 
every Tuesday you can send out an email um, with with some information and I'll give you many ideas as to what you can do <clears throat> to put in your Tuesdays with updates maybe one week it's just just wanted to let you know I'm still in need of a kidney transplant you're always going to ask them to share your story the first time they hear it they might not share it the third time they may not share it maybe even the fifth time but maybe that sixth or seventh time they'll share it so you need to continue to keep the story out there um, and and remind them uh, and educate them uh, the earlier uh, uh, misconceptions and myths that we had on the slide you can use one of those every week uh, to get some additional information out to them and I encourage people to have a Facebook page and a website uh, they perform different functions Facebook page is great to get something out quickly a website is good also because you're able to provide links and other information uh, and Facebook doesn't uh, allow that so you meet people every day as I said earlier and you need to be ready to tell your story right now we are wired for someone to say to me hi ha hi Harvey how are you my immediate response is fine how are you and so we need to get away from that hi Harvey has just become the standard okay and our standard response you need to get out of the habit so when someone says you know hi Caroline how are you you need to prepare to say to tell your story and you need to practice it so it's something you need to do and also for your advocates for them to be able to do the same thing when they say hi how are you well I have a friend or family member because that uh, 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 you know is an everyday life experience that we're going through and it's often lost in a minute if you don't respond very quickly they get on to something else okay or it, uh, I'm sure you've experienced this at the end of the day you bumped into someone on the street and you saw them um, and, and you forgot to tell them something that's because it wasn't top of mind and this needs to be top of mind and you need to practice uh, this is not the first time I've made this presentation uh, and before I started making it regularly I needed to practice to learn it there's another way and that is getting creative I have two rule, two rules for getting creative or what you could do and one is you need to be comfortable with it and I'll show you something uh, uh, that gets that point across and the other is it needs to be legal so it's pretty wide open in terms of getting creative uh, I encourage people to put together a business card uh, this is a card that I put together um, and you'd be surprised uh, the photo is the front uh, and the back of the card you can put a lot of information there to tell your story and again get the name of the uh, uh, transplant coordinator that's there car signs have become very popular um, you can get one for you know the back of the car or the side of the car um, when I talk about being comfortable I don't know if I'd be comfortable doing this okay but obviously you know this woman is um, and it also goes uh, men do the same thing for their wives so uh, there's there's really no no uh, shortage of being creative this is a lawn sign that you typically see for political uh, uh, campaigns and I'm not particularly thrilled with this sign because I think there's too much information there but they got a tremendous amount of local activity because they, was, they happened to be on a corner and they had many signs there so local newspapers picked it up um, and also you, you can purchase these signs for friends uh, and, and they can put it at their house uh, this is a, uh, a t-shirt that uh, was given to me I have Lewis's t-shirt uh, he recently was transplanted um, and Lewis got his transplant he, w he went to um, uh, concerts and a woman at concerts saw his t-shirt and the whole idea of wearing a t-shirt is getting additional exposure but to go to a concert or somewhere else what Lewis Lewis's idea was is he would walk up to people uh, if there was a couple or friends and 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 they'd say something about his t-shirt he'd say hey take a picture of me um, and 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 post it on your Facebook page so he got a tremendous amount uh, of, of exposure uh, from that uh, possibly you saw this t-shirt it's about three years old now is from Disney World 
and it went viral. Millions of people saw this T-shirt. Um, and I can't tell you why it went viral or what you can do to make something go viral, um, but he did get a transplant off of the T-shirt um, because so many people saw it. Uh, billboard signs are, are very common. Here's another billboard sign. But the point of my showing you this is not only will you get exposure from the billboard sign, but you'll get exposure by people writing about it. And that's what you need to do also. There's next door uh, that you could use. This is my favorite sign that uh, uh, I've ever seen. Um, I thought it was just incredibly creative for this young woman. Um, so I'm going to encourage you to do a search. <laughs> so go on any search engine and search Craigslist, Craigslist ad, I need a kidney transplant. You're not going to see 10. You're not going to see 100. You're going to see thousands. So even Craigslist, and I know quite a few people who have found their donor via a Craigslist ad. So that is something about being creative also. This is something you've done before in terms of this whole program of what I'm describing. If you've ever looked for uh, a job or gone through a, a job hunt, you've done this before. Okay. The first thing you need to do is develop a plan. Okay. Accept the reality of your situation. You research options. If you work in a chemical industry, you're probably researching that. Okay. You're educating yourself. I talked about that earlier. Talked about writing out your story. Okay. Write a resume. Okay. Networking. Okay? It's all about the number of people going through it. And telling your story is much like a job interview. And to get to the basic uh, uh, part of a job hunt, no one wants to do it. And no one wants to pursue a living donor. But it's something that obviously is very important to your life right now. So I'd like you to use that experience that you did in the past and practice it and, and continue to do it. Um, some other ideas, you know, if you see a website or some other idea that someone used, then, you know, you can take it. You know, imitation, it, it, is, it is the sincerest form of flattery. Uh, volunteer. I suggest people to volunteer uh, because of two things. People that give will often get, and it will also be an opportunity to meet other people who are givers. So volunteer. Uh, is a good opportunity. Uh, you can speak at fraternal, religious organizations. There are local meetups. Uh, again, no shortage of, of ideas. I suggest that people don't give their blood type or what blood type they're looking for. Uh, for these reasons, uh, it's just not necessary. Most people don't know their blood type. And I've heard of many situations where someone thought they were one blood type, they ended up being another. And even if they are incompatible in terms of blood type, there are paired exchanges. Some centers are doing these blood type incompatibles or plasmapheresis as a way of, uh, of cleansing uh, the blood. Uh, but as a result of paired exchanges, that really is, is the option for an incompatible donor. So I, I know you can do this, okay? It's, it's many people are finding uh, living donors uh, out there. And I hear often that someone got lucky, uh, but it's usually the luck is their hard work and not really luck. Uh, so there are three important takeaways. Learn as much as you can about living donation. You'll be more comfortable in talking about the process. Okay, find advocates. Again, not only family members and friends, it could be anyone that can advocate uh, for you and really tell everyone about your situation. I know the kidney is out there for you. You just need the work to get out there and talk about it. So let's take a look at some Q&A and, and see uh, if there are some other questions that, uh, that have come up or someone needs to uh, express uh, via their phone. So one question that came in was, how do you tell your story without seeming like you're looking for sympathy? Yeah, that is a difficult one. It is, it is not easy to tell your story. And so if you are um, uh, not telling it with, with any confidence, uh, it may be the person uh, uh, is, is, is looking to you as, in that way. Uh, but what I found is the more confident you are about it, the easier it will get and, and people won't be sympathizing in that way. 
uh, in the workshops uh, that I do at transplant centers and other organizations, and uh, on our website, you will see a list of, uh, of the upcoming programs that I have, and maybe you live in that area. Uh, we practice telling your story, okay, what I call the elevator speech. And even in that short time of practicing it, the feedback I get from someone is that you just saying it once was a big start for me to, to, to pursue it and, and, and feel more comfortable in telling my story. There are another any other person, questions? I don't know. Uh, another person was sure. asking if you come to the Dallas Fort Worth area to do workshops. Uh, I have not come to the Dallas Fort Worth area. If you are registered at a transplant center or if you're involved in any local organization, uh, please email me and I can work with you to, uh, to speak with them to see if we can um, arrange a workshop there. So I've done that. Uh, I'm going up to Albany next month, Albany, New York, uh, just uh, in a situation like that. Someone locally introduced me to the people there, and uh, now we're doing a workshop. Harvey, this is, this is Kathy. Um, so can, can you share how might somebody uh, if somebody's sharing their story and, and somebody either and the person they're sharing it with gets a little frustrated or um, put off, I get some suggestions on how not to make it awkward or how to handle that kind of a situation so they don't lose confidence in telling their story the next time? Yeah, the reality is, uh, unfortunately, that most people won't be a kidney donor. And so uh, most people uh, will likely not start to ask you more questions about it. So the whole idea is just to provide them. And on an earlier slide, I gave you a few a few ideas as to what to say. You know, uh, and, and I'll give you an example right now of what I would have said in the situation. Uh, for, for my need for a kidney transplant. Uh, for my first transplant, my story changed a little bit. But if someone said, hey, Harv, how are you? Uh, I would say, well, I'm not sure you're aware, but uh, I'm in need of a kidney transplant. I have this genetic condition that's uh, caused my kidneys to fail, and I'm pursuing a kidney transplant. The, the wait list is five to 10 years for a kidney from uh, a deceased donor. So I'm talking to people and educating them about living donation because a kidney from a living donor lasts about twice as long as one from a deceased donor. And you can stop right there, okay? If they don't ask another question, then life goes on to another subject, okay? Um, and you can even go on to another subject. And, you know, if there's a, uh, you know, the pregnant pause, you can ask them, how are you doing, okay? Uh, but there's no question about it that the conversation is not easy. And my analogy is the same as was the case when you were looking for employment. That conversation wasn't easy either to have with friends or family members. Um, but most people find employment uh, through a referral. Uh, now that world has changed a little bit, but certainly as you go up uh, in senior level positions, uh, it's more of who you know or getting a, a referral from someone. And so the only way you can do that is to tell your story. But uh, I'll be the first to admit it is not an easy thing to do and, and needs practice. Um, the slides I can either mail, email you or if you, uh, Kathy or Hillary, can uh, email you or send you the link that uh, is on their website that will have the slides that are there. Right. Right. Hello? We will have them on, online. Yes? This is Dawn from uh, Fresenius uh, Clinic 9025. Um, I did see something about a survey at the end, but being that we can't connect, how are we going to do that? Um, so I'll put a link to the survey on the, um, the webinar page. 
Uh, so if you go to the DPC Ed Center website um, and click on uh, the webinar, uh, the survey will be there. Okay, I'll do it that way. Thank you. Well, Harvey, I would like to thank you for sharing all of the information that you did. Um, it, it's a wealth of information. Um, I appreciate you sharing your time with us. Um, so thank you so much. Um, Kathy, thank you. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed uh, speaking with everyone, and I wish everyone uh, the best in their journey. Yes, thank you. Um, and I encourage everyone on the call to, to go practice doing, you know, write your story, practice doing the elevator speech of one minute with, with somebody that you know and, and give it a try. I also encourage, um, again, all of you to complete the feedback form. Um, your information and input is extremely helpful. And please join us next month on March 19th for our next webinar, which will be on vascular access. We hope you can join us again. Thank you, everyone, for sharing this half hour with us. Bye.